Our scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, verses 16 through 41. The soldiers led Jesus away into the hall known as the Praetorium. Then they assembled the whole battalion. They dressed Jesus in royal purple, then wove a crown of thorns and put it on him. They began to salute him. All hail, King of the Jews! They kept striking Jesus on the head with a reed, spitting at him and kneeling in front of him, pretending to pay homage. When they'd finished mocking him, they stripped him of the purple and dressed him in his own clothes. Then they led him out to be crucified. A passerby named Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was coming in from the fields. The soldiers pressed him into service to carry Jesus' cross. Then they brought Jesus to the site of Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine drugged with myrrh, but he would not take it. They then nailed him to the cross and divided up his garments by rolling dice for them to see what each should take. It was about nine in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription listing the charge read, the King of the Jews. With Jesus, they crucified two robbers, one at his right and one at his left. People going by insulted Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, so you are gonna destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself now by coming down from that cross. The chief priests and religious scholars also joined in and jeered. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from that cross right now so that we can see it and believe in him. Those who had been crucified with him hurled the same insult. When noon came, darkness fell on the whole countryside and lasted until about three in the afternoon. At three, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A few of the bystanders who heard it remarked, Listen, he's calling on Elijah. Some ran and, a soaked, and soaked a sponge in sour wine and stuck it on a reed to try to make Jesus drink, saying, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. Then Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The centurion who stood guard over Jesus, seeing how he died, declared, clearly this was God's own. There were also women present looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary of Magdala, Mary the mother of James the Younger and Jose and Salam. These women had followed Jesus when she he was in Galilee and attended to his needs. There were also many others who had come up with him to Jerusalem. Ancient words for our present day understanding. Thank you. I like Easter, um, but it's kind of a problematic time for me. Theologically, I know I'm going to hurt people's feelings. Um, I know I'm going to get into 
political things that people don't want to hear during a holiday season. And you know, each year I lie to myself for a while saying, okay, I'm just going to soften it up a little bit. And it only makes things worse. Um, so if you brought your Walkmans or your, you know, portable radios, um, we're going to talk about the cross today. And I think the cross is very problematic for people who either come from outside the Christian tradition or are Christians, but they've not sort of been bullied into the psychoses of thinking that's a healthy thing to believe that God got mad at humanity and uh, was pacified by torturing Jesus on the cross. I believe that the early church saw Easter very differently. I'm going to try to uh, demonstrate that during this season of, of, of Easter to see whether you see that or agree with that. Um, but I believe what has happened is because Christianity left its home of origin, went into Europe where there were empires and colonizing people, they had to take the politics of Jesus out for it to fit an empire, right? Whereas Jesus is resisting Rome in the story, when Christianity moves to Italy, it's going to go through some adaptations. And what it's going to do is allow you to praise Jesus and serve Caesar. That's what a lot of the early theology was. Um, it became anti-Semitic. And these, these verses at Easter time are always kind of scary uh, in that way. Um, the early church, uh, th there was probably some contention and bitterness and things, but that, that comes later, that, that idea that Jesus is a sacrificial lamb. I mean, Paul's going to use some of that language because he's, he used this kind of imagery wherever he went to try to speak in the vocabulary that people thought. But this idea that God threw a tantrum and that Jesus paid the price, and now it's okay, I don't think it's healthy, and I don't think it's really what the early church taught. Again, we'll see whether you think that's true or not. Jesus was very challenging to hierarchy. What we want to do is still be Christian, but leave the hierarchies intact, the political, the economic hierarchies. We want to be good colonizers to the rest of the world. We want to be good exploiters within the economy and not have Christianity be a problem. But I think the closer we get to the actual stories, uh, the more we realize that's not really possible, that we're being called out of whatever oppresses other people. And that type of Christianity that takes the politics of Jesus out turns him into a lucky charm. Right, something we can hang on our rearview mirror, something that will bless us no matter what we do, or how we treat other people. What I think the original message is, is a passionate plea for us to realize how we're hurting each other and to stop doing it. I think that's what it's talking about. As you know, Karl Marx was not a fan of Christianity. He called it an opium of the people. He said it's like flowers that we put on our chains. It, it numbs the pain of oppression without getting rid of the oppression. He said it's like the, the sort of the, the rainbow we see, the halo we see through our tears. And I actually think there's a wonderful truth in that. There is a joy and a beauty that people can experience even in the worst of times if they look at life through this love that's willing to suffer for other people. Lenin, there it is. Not John Lennon, but the other Lennon, the evil Lennon, the Lennon that no real Presbyterian would ever quote, um, said, 
Those who toil and live in want all their lives are taught by religion to be submissive and patient while here on earth and to take comfort in the hope of a religion of a heavenly reward. But those who live by the labor of others are taught by religion to practice charity while on earth, thus offering them a cheap way of justifying their entire existence as exploiters and selling them at a moderate price tickets to well-being in heaven. Religion is the opium of the people. Religion is a sort of spiritual booze in which the slaves of capital drown their human image, their demand for a life more or less worthy of a human being. What poppycock? What poppycock? As I said last year, uh, repeating this year, there are two ways to look at the cross. There are two sides of the cross. There's the side of those of power and wealth. That's not the side Jesus is on, right? That's not the side the nails are on. There's, there's a side of the cross where we feel the pain of the refugee where we feel the pain of, of the, the, the poor, the sick. It doesn't mean that you give everything away. Over the course of your life, you may, but it's not asking you to go into poverty. That may not be the, the most loving way to respond to this. It's not saying you have to leave the system of oppression because you were born into it. You're not going to completely overturn it. But to build an oasis in your heart of peace and love and justice and live there and live out of that highest value that a human being can have. And to not let your heart be shut down by political systems or economic systems because they will do that. So what's happening here, I think, is the cross is a symbol of everything we're afraid of. Every, everything that keeps us in our place, everything that keeps us from caring about other people, everything that tricks us into oppressing others so that we fit in the system. So the cross is the furthest thing from what Marx thought it was. It's feeling the pain, right? It's being moved by the pain. Even if you don't know what to do about it, to not shut your heart down. I think that's what the symbol of the cross is. Now, at Easter time, more than any time, it's, it's important to realize this is mythical texts. This didn't happen in history in this way. Um, first of all, they're not going to let witnesses go into the royal guard to see how Jesus is treated. Right? They're not going to say, why don't you bring a pencil and paper and come on in, and we're about to beat Jesus up a little bit. Why don't you, you know, record it for the Bible? Nobody saw some of these things. Uh, if there was a record, it came because there were slaves of the Romans who had friends who were slaves in Israel, right? It, it would have to be the servants that had a communion that, that, that did this. But more importantly, much of the Christian text is based on uh, um, Mythology doesn't mean it's false. It means it's a personal story about eternal truths. Things that are universally true are put in simple stories so that we can learn them. This particular story is based on Psalm 22. Let me just read real quickly some of Psalm 22. It's been said that this story is Psalm 22 in reverse. Psalm 22 starts off with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's kind of important to realize that when Jesus is on the cross, and all these theologians are saying why he did the cry of dereliction, he was quoting scripture. And probably he wasn't quoting it. This is probably somebody writing it down a lot later. And what they're doing is because those are missing stories, they're using Psalm 22 to say what this crucifixion meant. Their spiritual teacher was executed by the powers that be. What they want to show us is that hope and love were still possible for Jesus all the way through. So one, one of the lines is, why have you forsaken me? Uh, then the mocking in Psalm 22, the, the, the person that's speaking is being mocked. Uh, 
by people. They say, let God rescue you if God is so powerful. It talks about having the hands and feet pierced. That's kind of important. Casting lots for the clothes. So clearly this story is based on Psalm 22. It's illustrating the truth of of Psalm 22, which means like the psalm, it's a story of hope. Because the psalm is somebody's agony. They're being oppressed. They're being basically tortured within this culture. And yet they realize that the real power belongs to God, not to the bullies. That's not the illusionary thing that you're going to get together and have a church and, and all of the walls will come tumbling down. But over time, evil destroys itself. Over time, empire destroys itself. You can look at Putin and see sort of a death knell, but you can look at the United States for the last 50 years. Empires collapse. When power becomes more important than anything, when money becomes more important than anything, it becomes like a cancer that eats you from the inside out, and you can't build a big enough wall to protect you from the people that you've exploited. Right? If you don't do a vaccination for the whole world, guess what's coming back around? Right? This is not pie-in-the-sky stuff. This is the most practical, basic reality in the world, that if you don't love people more than you love property, it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt others. And a system built on property rights, not human rights, will implode because people will turn on each other. Right? They have no, no, there's no sinew. There's no principle of, of human rights that, to hold it together. So the Palm Sunday story is political almost all the way through. The, the, the parade is civil disobedience. Right? I mean, it's, you're, you're protesting in front of people. You're doing royal imagery with the Romans there. That's not going to play well. Overturning the tables that are based on exploiting people and charging people to come to the, the, um, you know, the, this place where all the people are. The withering of the fig tree is a mythological story about a prophetic movement. It's like Isaiah did and Ezekiel did and all these things. The fig tree was the symbol of the nation, right? So when this fig tree is withered, it's not Jesus throwing a tantrum, which is what it would be if you don't look at it politically. But politically, it is a prophetic thing saying, if we don't change course, we're going to collapse. Um, Jesus is crucified between two basically insurrectionists. You know, sometimes translated as thieves, but crucifixion wasn't for thievery, right? It's for insurrection. It's, it's somebody who's a threat to Rome. Um, and when you look at the title that's put on the cross, what is it? Yes. So being afraid that Jesus was some kind of a political leader is right there on the banner Right, so the traditional thing that, that, that God is mad at human beings and Jesus is paying the price on the cross is missing the whole point. The whole point is that empire crushed Jesus because Jesus was in solidarity with the weak and the poor. But the love that he lived out was stronger than Rome. Right? Thank God, because then we'd be speaking Latin if it hadn't been. So, as I said, there are two sides to the cross. I love Barbara Taylor Brown. I always reverse those last names. She's a, a theologian who says, and this is that important thing to choose the nail side of the cross and not the power side of the cross. Right? The type of cross they're talking about is not for sale at Avery's. Right? Nobody's made cufflinks or you know, bracelets out of this cross. Jesus was not killed by atheism and anarchy. He was brought to, and if you're wearing a cross, that's okay. This isn't. Jesus was not killed by atheism and anarchy. He was brought down by law and order allied with religion, which is always a deadly mix. Beware those who claim to know the mind of God 
and who are prepared to use force if necessary to make others conform. Beware those who cannot tell God's will from their own. Temple police are always a bad sign. When chaplains start wearing guns and hanging out at the sheriff's office, watch out. Someone is about to have no king but Caesar. Now, see, that's understanding the story mythologically. We don't know what happened back in Israel 2,000 years ago, but we know what's happening right now. We see it all around us. So these stories illumine our lives. The stories of Jesus are stories about universal humanity. It's the experiences that every human being has at some point. And pain, great pain, is a part of being human. Being threatened for being human and loving and, and caring about other people is a very central part of our life right now. There are threats flying all around. The story is being lived out all around us. How comforting it is to know that there were people that navigated the same situation. And we now remember that as the early church. We remember it as a joyful time. Um, so I have, um, could you do the slide thing? What I want to do to kind of reframe our image of the cross from the viewpoint of liberation theology, which is our victims in South and Central America, the religious people there, the nuns and the priests that we tried to snuff out as a nation, developed a type of religion that became impervious to the threat. And I think they understood what Jesus meant by this teaching. This is one of their El Salvadoran crosses. Can everybody see that? Am I in the way? It's not a picture of Jesus on the cross. It's almost like the cross is a window through which you're seeing Jesus. That it's sort of like that thing from Marx where you're looking through your tears and you see this rainbow kind of thing. That here is this loving, peaceful person who's not defined by the hatred around. Theories of the atonement reduce Jesus to that kind of brittle, um, angry, scary kind of, of, of religion. But this is beautiful, and, to, and it's a, a memory that there have been people all over the world throughout all time that have faced worse times than we are in and who lived in peace and joy and love. Could you do the next one, please? And this is where it's kind of dissolving into church. Let's see. Oscar Romero is a priest that was assassinated by some, uh, forces that were probably trained in the United States. It was on, at Easter time. This is why my mind always goes to the political. Because in El Salvador, not that far from where Ilda and Yvonne are from, the, the two people living in sanctuary at our church, um, not far from there, this is a priest who lived this story out, literally, and was shot down giving communion to the people. But he told them right before that, that even if he were to be killed and murdered, that he would rise up again in the Salvadoran people. That wasn't the belief in a body getting up and reanimating. It was deeper and more profound than that. It's saying that love is stronger than death that love is stronger than hate, that there is a hope that is stronger than the despair that sometimes seems like it overwhelms us. Could you do the next one, please? Another thing that happens is liberation theology. It's liberation for everybody. And there's nothing more hierarchical than patriarchy. So often these crosses and again you're looking it's, you're, you're sort of looking through love that's been informed by pain that's what these crosses to me look like but to have a woman at the center of them that's not uncommon at all and it's celebrating all the wonderful gifts that the women in the village uh, bring to the story and it's celebrating that as the kind of also a resurrection of jesus uh could we see the other one also the cross is a cosmic image. So it's like, even if human affairs don't work out, it's going to be okay. The story of the flood is very popular in liberation theology of, of a vessel that's getting through the storm. 
somehow, some way. Not everybody gets through it. In Psalm 22, there's a beautiful line where it says, even those who are not able to keep themselves alive are part of this hope. It's us, right? And some of us won't be there. Some of us won't make it. But that's okay because the love that animates our life will. It'll, it'll rule in our hearts and in each other. And that's the kind of ruler that Jesus is. Not a dictator looking down on people, but a friend who lifts up your own strength, who empowers you. That's liberation um, view of power. Uh, but it's in nature. Uh, nature will throw off this cruelty, this, these mechanisms. Another one, please. And it just kind of melts into the whole world. Or you don't have to be a member of the church. You don't have to be a Christian to be a part of this kind of joyous parade that's being talked about at Palm Sunday. Anybody who cares about all humankind is included in this message, in this gospel. And then finally, that's Bishop Romero. You see the cross. He's assassinated. That's Central and South America. But you see these symbols of peace and joy right there. They're so grateful that they got to be with Bishop Romero and experience his courage and his love, that they're not going to let sadness, fear, and hatred have the last word. They're going to choose love the same way he did. This is Oscar Romero. For the church, the many abuses of human life, liberty, and dignity are a heartfelt suffering. The church believes that in each person is the creator's image and that everyone who tramples it offends God. As holy defender of God's rights and human rights and God's image, the church must cry out. It takes a spittle in its face, the lashes on its back. As the cross in its passion, all that human beings suffer, even though they be unbelievers, they suffer as God's images. There is no dichotomy between human and God's image. Whoever tortures a human being, whoever abuses a human being, whoever outrages a human being, abuses God's image. And the church takes as its own cross that martyrdom. See, that's what Jesus taught. I don't know if there's two natures of Christ, three. I don't know if there's like a trinity that lives in heaven or a quadrant. Or, um, I don't lose a lot of sleep over that but I want my life to make sense. I don't want to be melted into the cruelty that surrounds us. I want to have a path I can walk. That even if I don't win in the end, my life will be noble. My life will be a gift of kindness to the world. That's all you can ever ask. We don't live forever, right? We die of something or we die for something, right? I mean, those are two options. So. I believe the cross is not a symbol of God's anger. It's a symbol of the human confusion. We get so afraid. We get so confused. We start valuing the wrong things. And the cross is everything we're afraid of. And the early church took up that symbol of threat and said, I'm not going to let this frighten me anymore. I'm going to live joyfully, peacefully, lovingly with this cross as my symbol of what the world tried to do to me from one side of the cross and what Jesus revealed to me on the other side. I want to finish with um, another godless socialist. This is Eugene Debs. He's another kind of person that lived out you know, this passage, even though they never um, probably didn't even believe in God. But when they, when they gave speeches, it sounded like it's coming from the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I, find, I, I find that very reassuring. This is, he, he's been accused of sedition for opposing war. This is his uh, defense, although it's going to put him in worse trouble. This is sort of like Jesus before Pilate. Your Honor, years ago, I recognized my kin, and I'm finishing with this. So. Hold on, we're almost done. Your Honor, years ago, I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better 
than the meanest on earth. I said then and I say now that while there is a lower class, I'm in it. While there's a criminal element, I'm of it. And while there is one soul in prison, I am not free. I'm opposing a social order in which it is possible for one person who does absolutely nothing that is useful to amass a fortune of hundreds of millions of dollars. This was a long time ago. While millions of men and women who work all the days of their lives secure barely enough for wretched existence. The time is coming in spite of all opposition, all persecution, when this emancipating gospel, interesting word for him to choose, will spread among all the peoples, when the minority will become the triumphant majority and sweeping into power inaugurate the greatest social and economic change in history. In that day, we shall have the universal commonwealth, the harmonious cooperation of every nation and every other nation on earth, or with every other nation on earth. I can see the dawn of a better day for humanity. The people are awakening and due time they will and must come to their own. Let the people everywhere take heart of hope for the cross is bending, the midnight is passing and joy cometh with the morning. Like Dr. King said, we may not live long enough to get there, but what a joyous path it will be to travel. I invite you now to your own reflection on these words.